As the 1970s went on, it was clear that automakers were going to have to meet increasingly challenging emission standards, and it would require more and more equipment to do so successfully. Thus, in 1975, cars were introduced with the catalytic converter, and there were different styles of catalytic converters that were adopted by the various auto companies. GM, for instance, introduced their large pancake-style catalytic converter that was filled with beads, and you'll notice on the picture here that there was even a plug on the bottom, as the thought was that those beads and their effectiveness would diminish over time, and so you could remove the existing beads and refill the catalytic converter so that it could become effective yet again. These pancake-style catalytic converters were great for controlling emissions, but they did have a side effect that was unfortunate and unintended, and that was that they robbed the engines that they were attached to of quite a bit of horsepower. There just wasn't that much flow through this catalytic converter, and as a consequence, engine horsepower diminished as by this time, engine horsepower ratings were being performed with the exhaust systems attached to the engine as well as all accessories, and that came about with the transition to SAE net horsepower ratings around 1972. Now, GM employed that pancake-style catalytic converter for a number of years, and GM actually licensed the technology for catalytic converters for free to automakers, really just in trying to do something for the public good. And that's often forgotten these days, but that is what General Motors did back then. Not all cars had to use it. There were some vehicles like Hondas with the CVCC combustion chambers that didn't need catalytic converters to meet emission standards, but most vehicles were employing them in 1975. Now, interestingly, while GM had that pancake compressor strategy, Ford had a different strategy associated with its catalyst. The GM style was a pancake catalyst that was included in the exhaust stream, generally after both of the header pipes had been joined into one. And then the one pipe would flow through the pancake style catalyst out to a single exhaust, as you see here on an Eldorado. And while that was GM's strategy, other automakers employed different strategies. For example, on most vehicles, Ford actually employed two catalysts that were located closer to the exhaust manifolds, one on either side of the engine for each cylinder bank on V8s. And that is actually a more modern style of catalytic converter. Today, you would see catalytic converters that are very close to the headers and the purpose of that is that it enables the catalyst to light off quickly and then start reducing emissions sooner than if it were further downstream in the exhaust system. Now, the downside to that is that you obviously have two catalysts in most cases as opposed to one, which was the GM style. So it likely was a costlier solution, but perhaps more effective. And that dual catalyst strategy was employed on many different full-size Fords for quite a few years including the LTDs, Grand Marquis, Lincoln Town Car, etc. Those all had two catalysts on the V8 engines of the time, whether that was a 460 or a 400 or something else. Now, what is then strange about Ford's anti-pollution strategy or emission standards strategy during this time frame? Well, notice that I mentioned that the full-size Fords, the LTD, Grand Marquis, or I should say in some cases just the Marquis at this point, and the Lincoln town car had two catalysts, but there was a vehicle in Ford's lineup that had a very strange emission strategy, and that was the Ford Thunderbird and Mark IV for 1975. Now, the Thunderbird and Mark IV were redone for the 1972 model year, and that really was, I would say, the best year for both vehicles as there were no five mile an hour impact standards for the bumpers front and rear. And the Mark IV in particular was the most handsome before the grille had to be redesigned for the 1973 model year and it just looked considerably chunkier. And then in 1974, the rear end had to be redesigned for the five mile an hour impact standard in the rear. And that was true for the Thunderbird too. So the 1972 Thunderbird is the only one with this front end before it was revised for 1973, as you see here. And the rear was pretty similar on the 73s and 74s. A little bit different treatment, but the bumper that hung on to these Thunderbirds on the rear was just, well, super chunky. Ford was never really that great 
integrating these five mile an hour bumpers in the front or the rear. But alas, I digress. And in any case, the Thunderbird and the Mark IV employed a very strange emissions strategy. And that was that as opposed to having two catalysts like the full size Fords or the pancake style catalyst like GMs, well, Take a look here, what Ford did. Do you notice anything strange about the exhaust pipes that are coming off the headers there? This is the factory style setup on the 1975 Thunderbirds and Mark IVs. And what do you notice? There is only one catalyst, and it's only on the driver's side bank of cylinders. Now, look at the passenger exhaust. That is how these came stock from the factory, with one catalyst on one bank. And the only reason that I can guess that Ford elected to do this was that they found that they could meet the emission standards with just the single catalyst, and so they saved out on one. They didn't put it on the other side of the cylinder bank, and I guess it's interesting, innovative, strange all at once. I'm surprised that this really didn't cause any greater engine issues, and perhaps it did, because you have likely different back pressure between the driver's side and the passenger side cylinder bank when you're executing this strategy. Although perhaps it didn't matter all that much because the back pressure was probably relatively similar at idle and relatively low RPM because there just wasn't all that much volume of air flowing through the catalyst. And I would assume that it would become more restrictive as the RPM increased but really, by the time 1975 rolled around, I think that the Ford 460, as an example, was making peak horsepower at around 3,600, 3,800 RPM, a really, really low number. And, well, when the engine isn't turning that fast, there's not all that much volume of air that has to flow through the catalyst. And perhaps that's the reason why Ford employed this strategy. Here's a photo from further back on the same car. And you'll notice you can see that single catalyst there on the driver's side and nothing on the passenger side. Then you have the H pipe and then you have the two exhausts running toward the rear. Now Ford also, I don't know on these Thunderbirds and Mark IVs must have had some electrical challenges because there are these grounding straps that are kind of all over the car. You can see them there from the exhaust to that cross member, the frame cross member. And there were also some grounding straps in the underhood engine compartment with some strange wire mesh grid things that rode over top of the inner fender wells. And I don't really know what was going on there, but you can see them. This is the stock setup. I also find it interesting at this point that Ford had kind of Swiss cheesed their torque boxes. You can see where the pads are to raise the vehicle, that there are these big holes in it. I think that that was done for weight savings uh, and perhaps also for drainage. Those were typical areas where these Fords would tend to rot out and rust out. Of course, if you have these large gaping holes, it also means that that area is going to be prone to collecting salt as well as debris, and that probably accelerates their rusting more than anything. So maybe not the best strategy. I don't know how much weight they save, but again, automakers were attempting to save some weight during this time, and the Thunderbirds and Mark IVs were very heavy vehicles. 4,500 pound plus cars during this time frame. So they needed to go on a diet. Let's take one more look here at the previous photo. And you also notice some interesting cross bracing that is happening here on this Thunderbird up front from that center member to the torque boxes on the frame and out to the front of the vehicle. Not quite sure if this was for crash or for just overall structural rigidity, but you didn't see this on Fords of this vintage, or at least all of them. And again, I think that they were probably trying to increase perhaps a little bit of both during that time frame. Well, now you know what lies beneath the Thunderbird and Mark IV for the 1975 model years. And have you seen that on any other vehicle? I know that I haven't, but I'd be curious. Put a comment in the comment section if you have, and what do you think about that strategy as opposed to GM's pancake catalyst style strategy? I remember crawling underneath one of these Thunderbirds and Mark IVs for the first time and seeing those catalysts or the one on the driver's side and thinking, what happened to the one on the passenger side? And originally assuming that the exhaust had just been replaced on the passenger side. But when I got a factory service manual for my 1975 LTD that had a diagram of exhaust systems in it, I found that I was in error and that this was actually the factory 
emission strategy. How strange it is. Thanks again for watching.